Hey, does, uh, we've been yakking. Anybody have any questions you might want to ask? <laughs> Nobody? No. Nope. Nope. Go ahead, right there. Question with, with your pick. My thumb pick, yeah. Does that work with any pick, or what is... What's yeah, yeah, thing? actually it does, and that's totally why I developed it, because when I, um, when I first started messing with the idea of all the two-handed tapping stuff, I was trying thumb picks and, and different various things like that. And then, you know, those were like an inch too long. And I mean, there's no alternation with that at all. So I start trimming them down. And even that wasn't right. And I remember even taking a pair of pliers and bending the angle out a little bit and playing with all kinds of stupid things. And so finally, I got the idea. I was like, well, why can't I make something that holds on to the pick that I really like to play? And so I made this pick clip. And um, basically, you can put any pick in it you want. You can set the level, the depth, and the, the angle of the pick that you like as well. And so then it, it'll work for any type of playing. And, uh, you know, you want to do an example? Do you want to play along with me on that? Uh, that uh, right here. Yeah. yeah. Yep, we we kind of just put this together, but. Uh, so that you can get any kind of style that you want on the guitar immediately. You don't have to put the pick in your mouth. You don't have to kick it out to the fans if you don't want to. But, uh, in fact, so. don't throw that pick out. Yeah. I, have, I have one of Chris's picks right down here at the bottom of my mic stand every night. And my tech's all reminding me, don't throw Chris's pick out. You know, Because at the end of the night, we kind of scrape the pick and chuck them out. Yeah, and the only reason that, that that's the case is because that's one. These, these I I've just got the prototypes for these. So... And they're going into production now, but uh, I gotta hang on to the ones I got, you know. <laughs> but if, if you're interested, just go to my website, chrisproduct.com, and, and I'm gonna have them for sale there. Any other questions? Someone way in the back. Yeah. The basil and Tango Prisoners? Yeah, the basil. Let's see. See, then you're asking me random ones. <laughs> All bases are set up different. <laughs> That's where it is right there. Yeah! Again, I got straps and tunings and stuff set up for me so I can like nail right on that. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Can you say my last words? My last words? Yeah, well that, uh, well the intro? Oh, the uh... <laughs> you know what's funny about this? I was on Facebook one day and somebody IM'd me. He goes, dude, I can't figure out my last words. And I actually got to to give him a lesson and teach him how to play it on the instant messenger. Because he was like playing some wrong note or something. He was like going, and I said, no, dude, it's, it's the you know eighth fret, A string, you know, and he got it. And he, he hit me back, goes, wow, I got it. You know, so anyway, he goes, that's all it is. And all it is, it's just a simple pentatonic lick. Just a little five note. And like Chris was saying earlier about learning things is it's like, you know, start slow, you know. Speed it up. Right? And then you just move it up in tempo. Yeah. Yeah. Back there? Yeah. Hey, Chris, um, before you came into the band, I'm sure you had to pick apart Chris Paul and Marty Freeman. I was curious if Dave wanted to learn any of his solos by ear or off the machine that he had. Um, Did you have to ever learn any of Dave's stuff before you came in to show that you could? No, not really. Um, I think, you know, and, and that would be another challenge in its own right. You know, Dave has such a personality in his playing, you know, it's so individual. Um, that would definitely be a challenge in itself, you know, to get that kind of stuff. But he never asked me to, to figure out his solos. That's what he's asking, by the way, in case you guys couldn't all hear him. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm glad because I felt like I, I had my work cut out for me. Anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, go ahead in the back there. I was wondering when you when you guys like say you're gonna write an album when you're doing a song, does like they call you guys up or for you guys call each other and say, Hey, I think I got something here, can we meet and then you all meet and you how know does the songwriting process 
move on. Well, that, that's actually a good question. He's asking about the songwriting process, and 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 because this last record, I've never made a Megadeth record like the one we just did, and quite honestly, it was actually one of the most fun records that I have ever made with the band. You know, at some years ago, of course, we'd get together. You know, there's a saying, you've got your whole life to write your first album and about, about nine months to write your second one, right? Yeah. So if your first one went through the roof, you probably got songs from your entire life's work, you know? And, and that's why lots of times people get what they call Platinum Paranoia, which is the second album. It's like, oh my gosh, now we got to deliver. And, and a lot of people can't do that in a short amount of time. And In fact, I remember as a kid, you know, being a Kiss fan, it's like Kiss was always pumping records out like every nine months. So obviously they were writing stuff on the road or however they were doing it. And it seems like we got like, what, two years, <laughs> right? Yeah. Tours are longer too, you know, but um, we started writing some stuff on the road. I mean, I think every one of us, we each had some things collectively that we threw into the pot. Um, and, you know, most Megadeth material starts with Dave writing a riff. You know, it really focuses around that. In fact, back in January, we had played at NAMM, uh, and then we got together for a few days and just kind of threw some ideas back and forth. and. And there was this one riff uh, in particular for the song called Never Dead, which is actually for a, for a video game. And uh, I remember Dave walked in and we were backstage in, in, I think, Adelaide, Australia, back in December. And he walked in and he just put his guitar on and this riff just fell out, you know. And that sometimes he creates his best stuff like that. He's not thinking and just bang. And we're all playing on it. And fortunately, he, he recorded it on his Blackberry and then forgot about it. <laughs> so we're, we're together a few weeks later, and I'm going, dude, what about that one riff? Because we're kind of trying to get the process going, you know? The Adelaide and, riff. Yeah, you know, exactly, the Adelaide riff. And, and sometimes, you know, those of you that are in a band know, sometimes you start with just something you got, you know what I mean? Because otherwise you're all standing around in the room going, oh, you got anything? No. <laughs> you got anything? You know, and it's, it's pressure to perform, if you will, you know? So uh, sometimes it's easier to just start with that. And, and, and so Dave's running around, and he's going, he goes, dude, I don't remember the riff. And... I think he ran into his office or something, and he happened to find it on his BlackBerry. He listened through to all of his messages he'd saved, and he found it. And he comes running, and he goes, dude, I found it. <laughs> and so we you know, got in there and jammed on it. And a lot of this album was sifting back through a lot of riffs and ideas. And, and there's, there's a bunch still sitting there that, that we didn't even touch on this record yet. Yeah, and then there were some, like, Public Enemy, I remember, I remember that uh, Dave had, uh, you know, he came up with that first riff. And we were playing it at sound checks, you know, kind of going through it, adding little pieces here and there. So that was, I mean, you know, the, the, the process can happen any way, you know. You can be under the gun and really have to think it through, or you can allow it to happen and, and just let the riffs kind of come out. Luckily, this CD was the latter. It really just flowed, you know. We, yeah, we kind of hit a window where it just, you know, we had, wait, wait, we, should, we did the Indio Big Four show. Yeah! yeah. Right? studio right after that and then the next show was in July another big four show in Germany so it's like between big four shows we basically cut a record you know and and uh, I like having especially now with these new video cameras you know like flips and zooms and all this stuff you know it's like I've got I've got some videos of me on my computer I was when we were in Russia I'm in I run into the bathroom of the dressing room and I got the flip up on the toilet and I'm sitting there like, playing something, you know, just because it was the quiet place that I could shred a riff out you know and, yeah. I, and I cataloged it you know I've actually got a couple of his riffs so if you guys are interested you know I'll send them to you later. Awesome. <laughs> Anybody else? Go ahead. How is the writing dynamics? With, you know, when you guys are writing and somebody writes something and just somebody say, oh, that one sucks, or hey, that sounds good. And, and then the other question is, do you guys stay within certain keys to the scene? You know, that's what I'm yeah, that, that's actually, yeah, go ahead. No. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the, the simple question first is, uh, I don't think we ever really avoid any particular keys, um, but uh, I think just the tendency on the guitar itself, you know, lends itself to some of those open chords. So E, A, F sharp a lot for Megadeth definitely is yeah. is one of the favorites I think, but um, I don't think there's any keys that are blackballed. You know, oh, we can't write that key. You know, you know it's typical like in Nashville, for instance, and I learned this while we were working there in a couple of records. You know that they have what's called the Nashville number system, which is essentially every every uh, note of a scale has a has a number. You know, the tonic is the one, two, three, four, right? And that's why they write it out like that because oftentimes they'll cut tracks with the singer in the room. And if a song is too high, the whole band can transpose it down, say, a whole step, right? So they, they're in all kinds of different keys. And that's, 
for pop and country music, that's kind of a typical thing, you know. But like what Chris said, most metal music and rock music, you know, it's, I mean, A, E, F sharp, B, you know, those are kind of common keys that seem to work really well. Your fingers kind of land there and, and wrists kind of develop underneath that. You know, and as, even, you know, as a bass player, you know, I, I learned early on in my first little Mel Bay books that I was learning self-taught how to play bass, you know, they taught about how to play across the neck, you know, especially like playing scales and things like that, because, you know, right underneath, figure, this is a five string, but if you got a four string, you know, four frets, four fingers, four strings, you got like 16 notes, you know, here I guess technically got 20, you know, kind of laying right here. So as a bass player, being able to play across, Plus, it, it, it sounds more connected when you're able to, like, move across as opposed to always, you know, moving up and down. And guitar players don't always have that luxury, especially if you're playing power chords, which are one five chords. And so if you're having to kind of motor around and shift up and down the neck. <laughs> A brutal riff on the new album. But, yeah, you know... Right? It's just, like, insanely difficult stuff to play, you know? But uh, which is part of the fun of doing it. But um, but even even for riffs, you know, if you're an F sharp, you know, like like play like the the Never Dead riff, for instance. So just... There's just kind of a riff that's laying right there underneath Dave's hands. That was the Adelaide riff, by the way. That's Adelaide. You know? Yeah, and so. Uh, and so there, you know, there's just things, there's notes and things that, that are movements and shapes that are right there underneath your underneath your hand, wherever you may, you know, wherever you may move it. So in our case, we don't usually write around the key of Dave's singing. It's more kind of the riff develops, and and then he kind of has to fit his vocal over that. So if he wrote the riff, he gets to fit his voice over it. So that's kind of how that works. So one more, and then uh, maybe we'll play Holy Wars, and then talk to you. Sure. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Right there. Chris, uh, when you're learning other people's solos, for example, like Marty or Chris, yep. do you have any difficulty like, between this different styles or some more dramaticism? So he's, he's asking, uh, when I have to learn uh, different players' solos, Marty Friedman's, Chris Poland's, do I have uh, do I have any difficulties with their different styles? And, you know, they all, they all produce their own challenges. So Marty Friedman definitely has those really cool... those kind of odd bends and that that major sharp 11 arpeggio that I, I think he loves to go to and uh, you know Poland has got the uh, so he's got more of like a chromatic pentatonic kind of feel about him and uh, they're both very unique and very cool and uh, you know, they all present their own set of challenges. Very different players, actually. I, I, I was very surprised, like, when I had to go back and, and figure out some of these songs, how unique they were, so.